All right, guys, welcome back. Survival Living here. Today, we're going to talk about these sunspots, solar storms, corona mass ejections, how to be prepared for them, what you should be expecting if we actually get hit by one of these. So if you've been paying attention to the news the last couple of days, I think it's about the last four days, a giant sunspot developed on the sun. I believe it was like 2.5 times larger than Earth. Now I didn't do a story on this because I was kind of watching it. I wasn't, didn't want to come up here and like cause mass panic or anything else like that. I was curious about it. I watched it for a while. Thankfully nothing major event happened as far as any eruption of coronal mass ejection coming from this or anything like that hitting Earth but our activity with the sun has increased massively i mean it just keeps on shooting off stuff now guys if you don't know what a corona mass ejection is we got hit by a very large one back in the i think it was about mid 1800s uh it was called the carrington event i believe it was like 1858 i'm going off the top of my head here the carrington event this thing was so massive it actually knocked out the telegraph all right, actually electrify the lines, shock the operators, cause fires. This thing here has the potential to knock out the power in our country and depends on what side it got hit on, that side of the earth, that's a lot. All right, that's a, that's a massive force. So when it comes down to a coronal mass ejection actually hitting earth, a massive one, and we, we've seen these coronal mass ejections, solar storms, things like that hit earth before. If we have a large scale one, like the Carrington event size again, what do we expect? Well, we expect the power to be knocked out. Some will argue that a vehicle will be fine if it uh, predates certain electronics. Others say the newer vehicles will run just fine because they're also hardened better. I don't take a chance on it, but some say, let's just say vehicles stop running. All right, we plan for the worst is what we try to do. The power will be shut off. It won't just be turned off. It won't be hacked. It's not like they can just go out there and easily repair it. Our power grid is not protected against this type of force coming from the sun. It will fry it. The transformers, and I'm not talking about the little transformers you see hanging off your power pole. I'm talking about the transformers that are about the size of a house. These things are not manufactured here in the United States. They're manufactured elsewhere. So they'd have to manufacture these and get them sent over here. All right. But remember, power is knocked out. It's going to be a lot to get these things in place. And I did a story a while back. Um, they actually have to widen roads to move these things. Many of them. <laughs> kind of hard to do when there's no power. Kind of hard to do when the equipment's not running. Yeah, so they say anywhere from five to 10 years before we start seeing remnants of some of that power coming back when the power gets knocked out. Your food, there's not gonna be any food deliveries. There's not gonna be food manufacturing. There's not gonna be food growing, well at least none that you can get access to like in today's society. The fact is, we need power to move food, to grow food. Now, it's one thing to have your own garden, but I'm talking about the whole of how the system operates. You gotta have power. You gotta be able to get fuel. You gotta be able to get feed, fertilizer, all the stuff for your, for your food. No power? It doesn't mean that you just turn off your light switch. I mean, everything stops. So food's gone, at least the way that we used to have it. One of the big ones, water. Water stops pumping. If you're hooked up to the city, well, that's gone. If you are hooked up to a well, which I encourage, if you got property and you have the option to, trust me, I know it's expensive, a well is nice. But even the system on a well can be affected too because they use electricity to pump it up. Yeah. If you got a hand-drawn well, that's awesome. Most people don't because most of our wells are so deep, it's kind of hard to get down there to it. Medication. 
medication will be a thing of the past. It will be the thing of the past until aid arrives. Pharmaceutical companies have been keeping people alive because of diseases or afflictions, you know, things of that nature. They're not producing these anymore. They won't be. There's no way they can. The whole logistics of moving things around to manufacture something is gone. We import a lot of stuff here in America. I'm afraid, I hate to say that, but you know, you can go yell at your congressman about that. They sold out the country a long, long time ago. Most stuff is manufactured elsewhere. Medication. And of course, the comforts of home. Your refrigerator, it stops. Your air condition, your fan, stops. You know, years ago, houses were built in certain locations to allow cross breeze in before air conditioning was a thing. Sure, they might have had a ceiling fan, but odds were it was designed to let air to come in and out and help cool off the house. Houses ain't made that way anymore. And quite frankly, they're not that cool anyway. So, like down here in Florida, it is brutally hot. Every time we have a hurricane, we go through power outages and it lasts a very long time before they can even get systems back up. And that's with the availability of getting the equipment in to an area and just fix it on a good day. Imagine when everything stops. You're not gonna have air conditioning if you're operating on, if you're living off of a, a CPAP machine, home dialysis machine, all these things, they stop, all right? Now, some of these equipments might be okay if they got a battery system, if they've been, you know, some type of shielding. Sometimes they can get away with certain things. And they'll last for a while until they have no ability to recharge batteries. Let's face it, if there's no electricity to recharge a battery, what are you going to do? All right, so I'm not just here to just discuss gloom and doom. Let's discuss some options. Now, I always come out here in the backyard. Yeah, there's a big old set of solar panels back there. Um, it's just a nice area that I can actually walk around while I'm doing my thought process, while I'm speaking, because I don't write things down. So, solar. Solar is an option as far as producing power. Battery banks. You know, there should be a pop-up video there, guys. That is where I went. There's a two-part series. It's a two-episode where I took our solar grid that we live with on our trailer, and I showed you step by step how I manufactured, built, set it up, everything. All right, solar is an option. You can build a solar grid, a decent solar grid for under two grand that you do yourself. Under two grand, you have the availability to run an air condition. During the daytime, I can run my window air condition and two box fans and run my lights, my TV, all that stuff all day long. No issue. No issue. Uh, at nighttime, since we upgraded our battery banks, we get air conditioned for six hours at night running off our battery banks. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Oh, and we also run a mini fridge. Next option, wind turbines. Wind turbines are a thing. Down here in Florida where I'm at, when it's hit and miss, I have to hit a, I have to hit up to uh, eight or 12 miles an hour for that wind turbine to actually start generating electricity. We had purchased that because we have property in Wyoming, which is always windy, and that's where we're gonna use that at. Down here, there's no sense in me even trying to erect it because we do not have the wind, the constant wind that I need to generate power. But wind turbine is an option if you're in an area that is windy. Another thing, if you've got a river or stream in your backyard, Hydropower. Hydropower to charge up battery banks, and if you got an inverter, produce AC power to run appliances. Those hydropower systems, little propellers you see that you can put in the water, the old water wheel. If you know how to design one, hey, that's an option. So, power. We can, we can make things happen to produce our own power. Now, with these systems, like I said, a coronal mass ejection hits like a Carrington level event. Won't it fry everything? If it's not protected, yes. All right. Most of your solar panels today will be fine from a corona mass ejection. It's what leads from that solar panel you have to protect. Should be a video pop up there for you guys. Uh, we teamed up with EMP Shield. They 
sorry guys the rooster sees me out here um, so with the EMP shield we have that for our solar grid not not that solar grid that's that's the solar farm for our personal solar grid that we use and live with we have it for our vehicle that's what we use this is to protect our equipment from a corona mass ejection EMP and lightning strike that's who we use you know, we're affiliated with it you don't have to buy anything I'm just showing you what we use it's one thing just to show, sell a product, but it's something that we actually invested in and use. So that's why we do it. That's why we show it. Now, I'm going to make sure I didn't step on no snake down here. The reason why you would have EMP shield on a solar grid, you're protecting your charge controllers. Charge controllers control the current coming in that those panels are soaking up from the sun to go to your battery bank. So you don't overcharge and you also don't discharge at night keeps your battery safe you also need protection for your inverters because that's what's transferring your power from DC which is coming from that solar panel is DC and most of your appliances is AC current that inverter needs to be protected so that's why we use EMP shield for our solar as for our vehicle we have a running vehicle you never know when one of these events is going to happen I see it all the time a lot of good a running vehicle is going to do you when there's no fuel being produced. Good valid point, right? I'm a prepper, so I stock fuel. And like I said, you never know when this is going to happen. So like right now, my wife's in town. If an event popped off right now, I know she can crank up that truck, which we always keep full of gas, and she can drive right here. That's why we have the protection. We're not planning on driving all over God's creation with the Tahoe after an event, but we'll have that option if we want to. Now, will people try to take your stuff? Yeah, if you're the only running vehicle, sure, but it's not going to happen the very first day. I believe if, if a corona mass ejection happened, I think within two to three days, and depends on where you live at. If you live in a crime ridden city, that's really bad in crime oh man I give you a day before you start seeing a lot of stuff and then when they realize that no one's responding to their crimes it's gonna get worse rule areas are gonna take a little bit more time but it still will come our direction it will because the facts are there's not enough law enforcement there's not enough law enforcement agents there's not en enough military even if they were all scrambled to watch every city every town there's not enough to cover the entire United States of America. There's not. Do the math, look at the personnel. There's not. Plus, the US government's gonna have to worry about foreign invaders. And that's the truth. If a country's down like that, especially with what's going on across the globe right now, yeah, yeah. Next up, water. Water is most important, in my opinion. Water is most important, mainly because I'm down here in Florida. Having stored water is definitely good. To, you know, that's just a prepper rule, having water on hand. But you can only store so much because of the weight and how much room it takes. So have other plans of water collection, rain barrel systems, swimming pools, even those little pull-out kiddie pools. If you got it outside in the shed or something, it's still going to catch water. We get a lot of rain here. Learn how to dig a shallow well. Now, you might want to check now in your area. Look online. You can find out what your water level is for a shallow well. And it'll kind of give you an estimate if it's even possible. Like our property in Wyoming, 72 feet to reach a shallow well water on our property up in Wyoming. <laughs> it's a lot of digging by hand, 72 feet. What you need to do right now, log into Google Earth, actually Google Maps is probably the easiest one. Click on on your phone, pull up your location, switch to the satellite imagery. Now zoom out. See any water sources nearby? Lakes, ponds, retention ponds, things like that, rivers, streams. If you do, take a day trip, go check it out. Is it easy to access? What's around it? Look at it. 
that might be a source of water for you when everything's gone. Now when it comes to drinking water that you're picking up, uh, well, let's talk about the worst one, retention ponds. Retention ponds are usually pretty close to a roadway. With roadway guys you see a lot of pollution in ditches as far as oil, antifreeze, pesticides from fields, stuff like that. So you need to make sure you have a water filter that can filter out this stuff. Just automatically boiling water is not always the best option. And the reason I tell you this is because some chemicals, when it goes into the boiling process, releases a gas. Okay? So a good water filter to clear out those chemicals, pesticide, definitely recommend that. You need to have that on hand. Something that you can actually filter out water. All right? If you're going to have to transport water, you might want to get one of those little red wagons. Something. Something that you can roll with. Something that you can pull behind a bike. I don't care because if you're carrying all this water, you're going to fall out in this heat. Let's face it, you'll be drinking, if not as much, to recover from all the walking by yourself, loading up with water. You get what I'm saying? Now, another thing of alternative power. Guys, we show um, solar generators on the channel. We get a bunch of them. Uh, these are for what we're going to be working with as far as a hurricane preparedness aid and stuff with the business. Something like this, something that you have a solar panel for, it's got its own battery bank system, something that you can power up a mini fridge if you got insulin or other type of medication that needs to stay cool. Something that you can power up fans. This is nice, but these things need to be protected. Now, we teamed up with the Fair, uh, Faraday Defense. They make a fabric. Basically, you make your own Faraday cages, is what we're doing, all right? So there's many different ways I've seen, and I've tried many different ways, and everyone's got their own opinion on things, all right? So that's fine. I'll just show you what we do and what works best for us. Having something like that, having those solar generators already protected, now you have availability for power. I'll tell you this much, though. The cost investment all right, for 2,000 bucks, you can build yourself a good solar system that's gonna run stuff, and it's gonna recharge every day, and it's gonna last a very long time. Almost 2,000 bucks, you can get a solar generator. It's limited to a certain amount of power, a certain amount of battery capacity, but it's portable. Basically, you're paying for the portability of that. And that's what you're paying for on this solar generator. So often it's up to you as a prepper, I try to have many different angles of alternative power sources. All right, so that's entirely up to you. But if you decide to go that route, you need to make sure it is protected in a Faraday cage. You need to build one. You don't want it just sitting on a shelf somewhere. Charge it up, box it up, seal it up. That way when you need it, you know it's protected and that thing will fire up. Gasoline generators, I got them. Love my gasoline generator. Fuel, unfortunately, will not be available. Sure, we got a stockpile of fuel, and what, what our plans are, we have it utilized and timed out for what we're going to be using certain things for. All right, that limited supply eventually will run out. If all you have is a gasoline generator and you cannot get hold of fuel, you're eventually going to run out of power. Now, with gasoline generators, I've seen the comments. People's going to hear that and they're going to come to your home. Yeah, they will. They will. Which is going to bring me to my next topic. Civil unrest. Guys, we see people fight over toilet paper. We see people fight over cabbage patch dolls. People fight over everything because they need it and they think you got it. I've seen the, the comments, you know, the thought process that people have on well don't cook outside because people are going to smell your food during this time a lot of people are going to be cooking outside but the fact is if you're a prepper and you got supplies power food water you're gonna to have to protect this stuff anyway the thought that everybody's going to be kumbaya and you're going to be king shit on the mountain, dawing out a little bit here, a little bit there, to the peons below you and everyone's going to be fine, or you're just going to sit up there eating your can of beans in front of everybody and everyone's just going to be envy, no, they'll revolt against you, that's what's going to happen, you have to protect your stuff, 
that's what you got to do one of the things I saw here on the internet they were nice gestures um, they have goodie bags goodie packages for when the people come to their home and they'll give them some food with a note don't come back or else oh they're gonna come back if there's no food out there and you have the availability to give them food they're gonna come back and they're gonna come back in numbers and they're gonna come back with numbers with bang bangs that's what's gonna happen I can't tell you what to do this is a moral compass for you I can tell you what's going to happen that's what I can tell you if you are planning on just hiding out when the stores are emptied and they will be people aren't just going to run out to the woods to look for food there might be some that go out there the fact is the wildlife population around our populated area is really thinned out animals aren't stupid they know where humans are now scavengers like to hang around raccoons possum stuff like that because we make such a freaking mess with our sanitation stuff we are always dumping food we're always dumping trash so that, you know let's stick around people will come to your home they will do you think that they won't whether or not they know you're a prepper or not you will get knocks on your door you'll get the saddest story don't fall for it it's all a ploy there might be one or two persons that actually do need help you know what I said don't fall for it. I can't tell you what to do you do you because that's what you're gonna do you're gonna do whatever you want to I'm just telling you the threats real and it will happen so we try to war game out as many things as possible that's what we do as preppers we look at scenarios we try to prepare for it am I scared of a EMP or a coronal mass ejection no I know the threats real so I prep for it that's what you need to do be prepped for it if you prep for it you have nothing to fear you already got your preps in place we already know bad things are coming our way thankfully most of our preps just like for a power failure complete shutdown grid down works with most of our other preps stockpile food water water filtration tools for security alternative power we have plans in place what I recommend everybody do is practice these plans shut up your power for the weekend go ahead see how bad it sucks I'm talking about shutting off your air conditioning too yep I know it's hot as hell we do it all the time that's how we test out our systems we know what works what keeps us going I recommend that for those who say oh I don't need power if you're living down here in Florida turn off all your power let me know how great it was in two days because it's hot as hell down here for the I keep all my fresh fruits and vegetables in the refrigerator well you may as well kiss that stuff goodbye within about two days it's going it's going you better be cooking that stuff up because it's not going to last long at all it's not learn how to grow your own food not everyone can that's just the facts because no one's practicing when it comes to growing your own food though you're gonna have to figure out a way to get water to that food to those seeds to those plants and now you got to figure out how you're gonna provide security for it but I'll tell you what man this is how I look at things this is exactly how I look at things this is what makes me a good prepper so I look I think like my enemy maybe because I lived such a horrible life many years ago yeah I wasn't a good guy I see your field of food out there and I've been watching you for about a week just watching because I plan things out I know about what time you go to bed I know about how many people's there but you're to fra la 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 and go on to bed I'm just gonna slip on in get what I won't slip on out it's just it's a big field you haven't been pulling security there's another thing people are desperate for food they're desperate for water they think you got it they see your garden they're not gonna come out and fist fight you no 
the smartest ones of all is going to shoot you from a distance. All right, you're going to have to pull security details. You're going to have to outreach out so you can see threats coming your way. It's a lot to it. And the fact is, these are things that you need to be training on. You do. Seriously. All right, guys. I'll speak to you later.